Hello, you are listening to the Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. I'm your host, Katherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer and Amazon number one best-selling author. You can find out more about me and my work at KatherineKerrigan.com and UnlimitedEnergyNow.com. While you're there, definitely sign up for my newsletter so you can learn even more about how you can heal yourself naturally. Now, today we're going to be talking about a subject that people all over the world love with great passion, and that is yoga. Yoga, as we all know, is one of the best tools in the world for natural healing. I myself have taught yoga for not just one, but 24 years, and two of my 10 books are about yoga. My guests today are... Dave Charlton and Ren Duroy, they are the co-authors of a new book called Embodying the Yoga Sutras, Support, Direction, and Space. They are both yoga teachers, fellow yoga teachers, and they run yoga teacher trainings and retreats in Somerset and Worcester. And you can find out more about Dave Charlton and Ren Duroy at their, and their wonderful work at their website, Sadhana Mala tra- Yoga Training.com. And again, that's Sadhana Mala Yoga Training.com. Welcome, Dave Charlton and Ranju Roy. Hi, nice to see you. Nice yeah, to be here. Okay, so Dave Charlton and Ranju Roy, for our audience, what exactly are the Yoga Sutras? Well, the Yoga Sutras are a form of Um, text that were written by somebody called Patanjali um, some 1600 years ago, maybe a little longer, maybe somewhere between 1600 and 2000 years ago. The the sutra form, a lot of people will have heard of the Kama Sutra, but in fact the sutra form is uh, is a form of text in which um, the text is composed of very short aphorisms or short statements. And it was a very popular form of composition um, in ancient India. So the Yoga Sutra, as I said, written by Patanjali, um, are 195 short, pithy statements about the philosophy and uh, practice of yoga. And um, they were written originally in the ancient language of Sanskrit. They're quite obscure and quite, uh, um, they're, not, they're not the easiest text to understand if you just read them. I mean, first of all, there's the issue of how to translate these ancient Sanskrit texts, because um, if you take a single sutra and then look at 10 different translations, you'll get quite a lot of different meanings. So I think the issue of how to translate them is the first thing. And secondly, quite often, they're quite dense, you know, what does that mean? What, you know, how do, how do, because there's a lot behind each sutra. So the yoga sutras are 195 statements about yoga divided into four books. And then, um, then we have the task of decodifying what exactly they're about and what that means, but that's what they are. Now, who was Patanjali, the author of the yoga sutras? Well, Patanjali um, is really an honorific name. Um, the word Patanjali, th- th- this, when, when you hold your hands like this, it's kind of like in a prayer gesture or a cup, cupping the hands like this. This is called Anjali, Anjali Mudra. This is the gesture of Anjali. And Pat, the word Pat means to fall. So Patanjali is the name given to this author, or maybe it's his, his name, but it literally means to have fallen from the skies into these praying hands. There is some debate as to whether Patanjali, you know, who Patanjali was, because it's a mythological, it's a mythological name. Um, and legend has it that Patanjali wrote three different texts, one on yoga, which is called the Yoga Sutra, 
one on the Indian medical system of Ayurveda um, and one on grammar, on Sanskrit grammar. Now it's an interesting idea that these three different texts help us to deal with three different areas of um, confusion and suffering that we may experience. The Yoga Sutra, interestingly, is not a text about the body, it's a text primarily about the mind. So it's a kind of, a, you could see it as a psychological text. The text in which Patanjali refers to the body is actually the one on Ayurveda. So Ayurveda is the text, his, his text on Ayurveda is the text which um, helps deal with problems of the body. And the text on Sanskrit grammar helps us to make sure that communication is clear and that we're speaking in the correct, you know, in speaking in a, in a, in a clear way. So Patanjali is a, the, now the legend or um, tradition has it that it was the same Patanjali who wrote these three texts or who composed these three texts. In all likelihood, um, they were different people. And, and some scholars even say that the Yoga Sutras is actually the work of more than one person. So we, 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 we don't know the truth of that, but um, some scholars say maybe chapter four was written by somebody else. It's divided into four books. But Patanjali, Patanjali was basically uh, an ancient mythological scholar. Well, I is that right? Would you a mythological scholar? I don't know if that's right. But well, in some context, yeah, in some way I think you could say that. Yeah. Or certainly a, a, a practitioner or teacher, very likely. Yeah. Yeah. So Dave Charlton and Renju Roy, you are the co-authors of Embodying the Yoga Sutras Support, Direction and Space. Mm. Why in 2019 are you, did you all write a book about a, an ancient text? Because well, we want to explain to our author, our, our audience, why these Yoga Sutras are relevant today. So why did you all write a book about the Yoga Sutras? Dave. Okay. And did, so Ranju, why did you write a book about the Yoga Sutras? Well, um, the basic uh, things that, the basic reasons why human beings suffer haven't really changed in 2000 years. We all have bodies, we all have minds. Sometimes we wake up feeling bad, sometimes we wake up feeling good, sometimes our bodies fail us, sometimes we get frustrated. So the psychology and physical aspects of ourselves haven't vastly changed in 2000 years. Of course, the contexts have changed. I mean, our lives are not the same as lives of, of uh, people living at the time of Patanjali. I think that there are many, um, there are many, many uh, philosophies and um, ideas which can help to help um, help improve our lives. We, Dave and I, both studied the Yoga Sutras in a way that made it made it not an ancient teaching but a very contemporary teaching. So when we studied it with our teachers, we studied it as if it was written yesterday. And, and, and the practice was not divorced from the philosophy. It, it, you know, in a sense, I suppose you could say, well, why have you written on a book on the Yoga Sutra? But in a way, we, we didn't feel that's what we, we don't feel that's what we've done in a way. Yeah. We feel like we've written a book on yoga. Yeah. And actually, in the way that we were taught, yoga, both it, the practice of yoga involved ideas, teachings and methodology based on the Yoga Sutra. So in a sense, it was kind of, particularly in the way that we, we were taught, mm. um, you, you, you can't help it really. <laughs> it's kind of part and parcel of what, of what we're doing. Right. There, are diff there are different traditions of yoga, you could say, and the way that we were taught, each tradition might have a sort of a source text or a, or a particular, not exactly a textbook, but something which is at the heart of that tradition. And the Yoga Sutra for us really was the heart of the way we were taught. Okay, so let's get into the meat of the interview for our audience, which is why are the Yoga Sutras relevant even today? So 
Dave Charlton, what is your thoughts on why the Yoga Sutras are relevant even today? Well, again, certainly within the tradition that we've learned, the first thing is that they give us the basic methodology of why we do what we do. The one thing that really attracted me, I think, to this particular approach to yoga was that we had a, a really clear rationale, if you like, and a really clear kind of uh, structure for how we um, actually approach the practice, how we did the practice. And that was all referenced back to the Yoga Sutra. So um, first thing to say, I guess, is that the Yoga Sutra uh, gives us our rationale for practice. Second thing, and perhaps just as importantly, is that really, certainly from our point of view, uh, the focus of yoga is really on the nature of, the, of our minds and how our minds influence how we live, how we think, how our body functions even. And so um, the, the thing about the Yoga Sutra is it contains many gems, many ideas about both the nature of our mind, but also how to work with it, how to, how to use it both within the practice and perhaps more importantly in a sense, it gives us lots of ideas and principles that we can take into the, the wider context of our, of our lives, basically. So um, really the Yoga Sutra gives us our blueprint, if you like, uh, in a sense both for practicing on the mat and also practicing off the mat. Okay, so for our audience who are not familiar with the Yoga Sutras, can you give us some examples some, of some of the key Yoga Sutras? I'm sure that there's more than one, but perhaps maybe your favorites, or the ones that are most meaningful for you. You want me to start? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, well, you're right. There, there's about 195. Uh, 195, 196, depends a little bit on the version of the Yoga Sutra you have. So there's plenty to choose from, uh, but it's certainly true that, that some are perhaps stand out more than others. And one of the things that we've, we've done in the book is just to really focus on about 16 or 17 of them. Now, having said that, I would say it would be, it would be useful for us in, in presenting this, but also I think it's true. Uh, if we come back to the, sec the, very, the second sutra of the, the text itself, which is Yoga Hachita Vritti Nirodha, which essentially basically defines yoga as a state of mind. And that's the first thing. Um, however, For audience, that would be yoga is the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind, correct? Yeah. That's one translation, yes? Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. Um, but that, in a way, that gives us our, our basic rationale for, for the whole practice. And uh, in the way that we would, we would um, interpret that sutra, certainly in a practical sense in terms of practice, we would perhaps just kind of reframe that a little bit and we translate it as it's something like yoga is the state of mind where the mind is focused and more peaceful and we are less disturbed with. Um, we're less troubled by disturbing thoughts. So it, it both gives us the, the basic ground we're working with, namely our state of mind. Um, it tells us something about what, a state, what sort of state of mind we're, we're, we're looking for, a state of mind in which we're very focused, that the mind is very clear, and we are less troubled with um, difficult thoughts. And it also gives us a way of thinking about whether the practice has been successful or not. Because if at the end of the practice you feel clearer, more settled and more focused, you can say you've, you've been practicing yoga. And, and, and really, if, if that hasn't happened, then perhaps you've got to question the, the nature of the practice that you're doing or how, how you're approaching it. Mm -hmm. I love that. So you can use the Yoga Sutras to sort of evaluate the quality of your own practice and also the quality of the teaching you've received, right? Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yes. absolutely. It gives us benchmarks, you know, it gives us our basic rationale and it, and it gives us ideas to, to, to both understand the practice and to see whether we think we're on track or not. You know, are we actually moving in the right direction? Because with all of these sorts of disciplines and practices, it can sometimes be quite a fine line as to whether they're actually supportive and helpful 
mm. or actually you can practice them in a way that actually um, you could appear to be practicing them, but it's actually in a way that somehow takes you off track or, mm. or actually leaves you with more problems than when you started. Mm. <laughs> so I think it's really important to have some, have some, um, some measures, some benchmarks, some ideas about, uh, to give you confidence you're on the right lines. That's so, very nice. Yeah. yeah, Ranju Roy, what about you? Is there a particular yeah. yoga sutra that really means the most to you and your practice? Well, there are, there are many, and uh, I think it would depend on, depend on the time of the day or whatever. But a couple that come to mind at the moment, the first one is um, Sutra 16 of Chapter 2, which is Heam Dukkam Anagatam. And this means... A loose translation of this would be um, when you're in a hole, stop digging, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> okay, so this is the idea of um, can we avoid suffering which is yet to come, or how can we uh, live our lives in a way which does not contribute to future suffering. Now, there are things, you know, we cannot completely avoid all suffering. I mean, that's just not going to happen. There are going to be all sorts of types of suffering that are on their way in different contexts. However, this sutra um, suggests that there are ways that we, and, and it's very interesting the, the actual Sanskrit words, which we spend a lot of time with, are also important. Then they're, they're, they're different to English translations of those words. So I'm translating the word dukkham as suffering, which is a very common translation. But the actual word dukkham really is, is made up of these two syllables, du and ka. And what that means is bad space, you know, it's a bad space. It's often linked to a bad space in the heart, a, bad, a kind of emotional bad space. But there are also different um, connotations of the word dukkha. Now, as I said, I don't think it's possible if you're a human being in an incarnated body to avoid all suffering because things will impact upon us and we'll get upset or we'll, we'll, we'll suffer um, physical and, and, and psychological um, pain at some point in our lives. I think it's unrealistic to believe that that won't happen however having said that there are also ways that we can uh, further contribute to our suffering and there are ways that we can also most elegantly deal with the suffering that we are dished up if you like so heam dukkham anagatam is uh, one sutra, which I think is very important, which also, as Dave was saying, it gives us a reason to practice. It gives us, you know, what we're doing in a sense is um, we, we're not future proofing ourselves at all, but we are contributing to um, a, a more skillful way of living. I love that. I love that. A, a more skillful way of living. Okay, um, and again, I think the yoga sutras have so much wisdom. So, Jade Charlton, when you're practicing recently in your recent yoga practice, are there any particular yoga sutras that you're really thinking about when you're practicing your yoga? Okay, well, I think um, what we could draw attention to is uh, Sutra 12, which is the first sutra. Uh, 12th sutra, the first chapter, which talks about two essential principles, which are abhyasa and vairagya in Sanskrit. But um, obviously, we need to explain those. Um, and th this particular sutra, in a sense, gives us the basic method that we're that we're using. In fact, um, it was quite a revelation to me some years ago when one of our teachers said to me that the basic method of yoga is Abhyasa and Vairagya, everything else is elaboration, which was quite, you know, which is quite a strong statement to make in a sense, you know, it was very definite and, and actually that's kind of stuck with me really. Uh, so, so what, what, what are these two ideas? And um, we have the, the principle of Abhyasa, which essentially means uh, practice or kind of discipline, but really what it's recommending 
is that you have to do something. Okay, and you have to do something and you have to have a practice you have, and implied by the idea of practice is something that you need to work at. It's something you need to do over a long period of time. There needs to be a, a certain continuity about it and you need to approach it with a certain enthusiasm and, um, and commitment, I guess is the right word. That's the basic idea. However, on its own, that's not sufficient. It needs to uh, be tempered by it, its twin, as it were, which is the notion of vairagya. And vairagya is about something, the attitude that we bring to this, this practice. And it's about, um, to keep it quite simple at least, it's about approaching the, the practice with a degree of openness and um, willingness to accept what comes from the practice without being too goal oriented or with about being too tight in the way you approach things or um, yeah without being too tight and tense in the way you approach things so there's this you need to do the practice in a particular spirit in a particular way and really this th these two ideas doesn't matter what your practice is whether you're doing the, the asanas, the postures, or you're doing the city breathing, or you're doing meditation, or you'd be doing chanting. In a way, the basic principle is that you need to uh, apply yourself, abhyasa, and you need to have a certain um, attitude and openness, a kind of light attitude, which is vairagya. I would say that's my, that's my, it, 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 if I'm honest, that's my favorite. Okay, I love that. Now, when students come to you and they're new students, you know, one of the things that I'm always saying to my students is part of doing yoga is learning how to do yoga, right? <laughs> and it's exactly what you're talking about, but have a practice, be, but being open to what is in that moment. So when, new, when people are coming to you for as you new students or even in your yoga teacher trainings, what are some of the yoga sutras that are most relevant, do you feel, and most helpful for people who are new to the practice of yoga? Wow. Um, I think that um, one of the most important sutras for people who are new to, the, to, to our teaching uh, is Sutra 3. Six. This is Tasya Bhumishu Vinayogaha. And what this means is that yoga develops individually and develops in stages. And every single one of us has a different path. I know that, I mean, probably if, if, you know, I'm sure as a yoga teacher yourself, certainly Dave and I, you know, if we introduce ourselves as yoga teachers, quite often people will say, wow, can you put your foot behind your head? Or, <laughs> oh my God, can you do the lotus posture or something like that? And, um, and I've also heard people say, oh, I couldn't possibly do yoga because I'm stiff. Which as somebody, somebody, I saw somebody saying, that's like saying, I couldn't have a bath because I'm dirty. <laughs> you know, it's got not, you know, if you're breathing, you can do yoga. However, what you do will be dependent on who you are. So the way you would teach or the way that we would teach uh, an 80 year old or a 90 year old is very different to the way we would teach a 20 year old. Somebody with a lot of time and a lot of interest, we might teach them in a different way to somebody who's got a bad back and has got 15 minutes, you know. So this is the idea, Tasya Bhumishu Vini Yoga. There is no individual, um, uh, there's no brown belt, blue belt, red belt, black belt. Everybody should be taught yoga specifically according to their situation and their needs, their potential and their interest. So this is, this is Tasya Bhumishu Vini Yoga. Develop each person in, from an individual perspective. I just love that and I couldn't agree more because no matter who we are, we always have to start where we're at. Exactly, right? yeah. You know, and it's funny because I'm 60 years old and I've been practicing yoga 
for 26 years, teaching for 24. And I, I remember when I was younger, you know, I thought, well, advancing in yoga, getting good at it is doing yeah. all the advanced poses, like you said, yeah. putting your foot behind your head. And mm. now as a long-term teacher, I feel that having, being good at yoga means having a consistent practice, right? That's much more important. Yeah. Showing up. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So now Dave Charlton. So let's say somebody's been practicing yoga for a while and maybe they know how to do a down dog or they know how to stretch their hamstrings and they're learning how to breathe. What are some of the yoga sutras that are going to help people develop their practice and become better yogis? Okay. Um, well, and, and I, I, th I think it's perhaps just worth saying before I answer it that, that when, when we're practically teaching people, particularly when they're just learning, we might not actually mention the actual sutras themselves at all. Mm -hmm. um, but, we, but what we are doing is we are seeking to embody the, the principles and suggestions that are, that, that are there within, within the practice. And let's just take down with dogs since, since she mentioned it, it's a bit of a, a yoga icon. Um, and I think what we could do is we could look at the, the sutras or we could apply the principles of the sutras on asana, posture, yoga postures. Of the 195 um, odd sutras, there are three which expressly deal with the, the, um, the practice of uh, yoga postures. And what they do is they, they kind of talk about the, the qualities that one would seek to um, cultivate within a posture and what exactly, um, a bit like it did with at the very start of this conversation when we talked about the state of mind we're seeking to cultivate, it says in the uh, second chapter of the Yoga Sutra, it talks about the qualities of stira and sukham present in an asana, a posture. And that if this balance of what we could uh, say is a balance of stability, of form, of precision and attention, along with um, which is kind of again balanced with a sense of softness, ease, and spaciousness. Then, in a way, that combination is represents what really is is understood as a yoga posture. And it goes on further than that to to move on to tell you the means by which you you should seek to cultivate that. And in the way that we understand that sutra, I'm talking about the 247 now. So the next sutra along. Again, there are two, um, two ideas mentioned. One is called Prayana Shaitya. Um, Sanskrit is not important, but the way that we understand it is that we have a particular, we use a particular kind of effort to loosen up and open up space in the body, both in a physical sense, but it's more than that, actually. There's the space that we think about opening up is more than just a physical space. It's also a space in your head. It's also kind of like a psychological space. Mm. And that special effort that we use, in this particular approach at least, is there's something very special about the way we breathe and we use the breath within the postures and we direct the breath within the postures in order to create this, this sense of opening and also a very deep and special sense of involvement in, in what we're doing. And what you discover if you study the yoga, the, these sutras that deal with practice of postures, is that in fact they're very multi, multi layered. So you can look at them and interpret them in a very kind of basic way, which gives you some basic ideas. But there are kind of levels of meaning which we can continue to explore throughout our, I was going to say yoga career, for want of a better word, <laughs> and which give us the opportunity to um, find new levels of meaning, subtlety, and um, depth in what we're doing. Yeah, I just love that. And you know, again, I've taught for 24 years. I've signed up, I just signed up for a yoga retreat at the end of the month with a friend of mine, and I'm going specifically to study with her. So there's something about yoga 
that is very engaging where we can literally study it our whole lives. Mm-hmm. So, so both of you, Dave Charlton and Renju Roy, how does studying the Yoga Sutras, do you feel make you better yoga teachers? And I, I have to ask you one by one. So how, Dave Charlton, how do you feel that studying the yoga te- sutras makes you a better yoga teacher? Well, um, I think the thing that it does for me is it keeps me on track. As much as anything else, it keeps me on track. Because it contains the basic principles and guidelines for both practicing and teaching, actually, it, by implication it has quite a lot to say about the nature of teaching as well um i i think it 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 pulls me up short on periodically to think well is this actually is this what they mean is this what i'm really seeking to achieve is is this what i'm trying to transmit um and it kind of brings me back to um time and time again actually to kind of reevaluate how I'm uh, approaching my teaching and how I'm uh, applying the various principles and um, hopefully refining, I guess, what I'm, what I'm doing and the, and the way that I'm doing it. Ranju Roy, how do the yoga sutras help you to be a better yoga teacher? In this world of goat yoga, beer yoga, <laughs> x yoga y yoga z yoga you know there are so many different activities which go on under the name of yoga so um for me the yoga the yoga sutras uh, as dave said you know is a is a is a touchstone it's a support which helps okay it's a support which helps to clarify a direction, both in my practice, my personal practice, and also in my teaching. Yoga Sutra is a touchstone or a support which helps to clarify a direction. And hopefully that direction opens up a space. So for me, it is the, you know, everything we do, even if it's not explicit, as Dave said, it's not that we're thinking, oh, you know, Sutra, Two, ten, or whatever. But everything that we do, I think we can refer back to some idea or some concept which comes from the Yoga Sutras. And it helps. It, it kind of feels like there's an authenticity. Um, it's a living tradition. It feels like it's yoga. It feels like it's something different to beer yoga, goat <laughs> yoga, or whatever yoga there is. It feels like there's a kind of a, a, a genuine authenticity. I, I love that. I, I have to share this story. I remember years ago, because I have six 200-hour teacher trainings, one 500-hour, and I was studying yoga therapy, and I'd be a yoga therapist, but I'm like, nobody cares. It's like I have so many certifications. At one point, I was going to study, study dog yoga. <laughs> we have to laugh about this. Only the lady at the last minute wasn't able to bring her dog on the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> well there you go <laughs> yeah and so you know as you said there's been this explosion but the yoga sutras as you say are a common thread through all the different forms of yoga that help to inform what it is that we're doing i think for us it's not to say that that's the only text i mean for other people it might be something else but for us it's a touchstone which really helps us as dave said to keep us to keep on track and to feel that what we're what we're teaching and what we're doing has something behind it. I mean, this is a sixteen hundred year old text. It's been used for a long time by a lot of people. So it feels it has a certain, you know, the word. It's interesting. The word guru. The word guru literally means heavy. Okay, <laughs> guru means heavy. And there's something. I'm not saying that. You know, I'm not saying anything. I just like the idea that a guru. A, a guru has gravitas. There's some weight. There's some, you know, there's something substantial. And I think the yoga text is a guru text. It's a heavy text. It's, you know, it's got a, it's got a, a, it's some it's, meat, isn't it? It's got some meat to it. Yeah, it's not a flaky. It's not flaky. 
Right. And it's just got so much depth to it. You can, we've been exploring the Yoga Sutras for 30 years and still unpacking, still unpacking, still unpacking and making new connections. So it's a really exciting, um, it's a really exciting tapestry, which we're continuing to engage with and, and weave and develop further. Okay. Now here we are at the natural healing show for UK health radio. How do you feel um, that the yoga sutras can help us become healthier and in our healing practices? Well, I sincerely believe that every single person would benefit in a positive way from practicing yoga regularly. Whatever your age, whatever your abilities, whatever your capabilities, I sincerely believe that. Um, I think the issue is, and there is an issue actually, is um, what people need to practice an appropriate yoga practice. And it isn't the same if you're 25 and fit, or you're 55 and stressed out, or you're 75, whatever. It, it's, it's not the same for everybody. And, and, and therefore, I, th I think the, the, the issue in, in practicing yoga for your health is to, is to find an appropriate yoga practice. Now, what I think they all have in common, and certainly, again, this very much reflects our approach to things, is that what, whatever your situation, pretty much, I would say, um, the key to using yoga effectively and therapeutically is, is the breath. The breath is our kind of principal tool. Apparently it was um, a favorite saying of one of our Indian teachers, Krishnamacharya, who was Discachar's father. We never met Krishnamacharya, but he was, he was there in his, in his, um, he in was his teaching, if you like, yeah. Um, and he used to say that in the right hands, the exhalation is like a surgeon's knife in dealing with disease. Mm. So he, I suppose what he was in. Right. And Renju Roy, so, uh, so uh, Dave Charlton was saying that the exhale is like, a, in the right hands, a surgeon's knife, mm -hmm. right? So what did he mean by that? Um, the exhalation is linked, you know, they, it has a very different energy to the inhalation. The inhalation and the exhalation have different energies. The inhalation, you could really think about as an opening to life, as a bringing stuff, you know, opening and bringing stuff in. Exhalation is also, exhalation is much more about letting things go, getting rid of stuff. And I suppose what a surgeon's knife does is to, you know, is to, to make an incision and to take what is not, um, what's not necessary or what's not helpful yeah. out. Yeah. In the, in, in the best way of working with the exhalation, we're using the exhalation as a tool to rid ourselves of toxicity at various levels. So the exhalation was always taught to us, and we teach the exhalation as our starting point. Develop the exhalation. You can't take new stuff in if you're full. So first thing, the exhalation is about clearing out the rubbish that's already there. That is our, you know, before you start taking anything on. I remember Paul, one of our teachers used to say, you know, if you've got a full bookshelf, you know, and you buy a new book, well, what are you going to get rid of first? So, you know, you can't add anything. We're already full. We are all so full. We're yeah. so full. The exhalation is about clearing out and making a little bit of space in order to possibly receive something new. I just love that. And in my most recent book, my ninth book, The Little Book of Breath Work, I point out that people who have high blood pressure are generally not exhaling properly, right? Sure. And if you're not breathing into your belly, then by definition, you're stuck in the sympathetic nervous system. So I tell people, you know, if you don't remember anything I say, 
you can tell how stressed you are by the quality of your breath. And when you're sure. breathing all the way into your belly, you're there. So what do the yoga sutras tell us about breathing? Well, it's interesting about breath. I mean, just Dave said that there are only three postures, uh, three sutras which talked about um, the posture work, asana. There are, there, there are also not very many which specifically talk about the breath, but the ones that do talk about the breath are very, very insightful and punchy and powerful. One of the things that um, Patanjali says in the Yoga Sutra is that when we are experiencing difficulties, when we are experiencing interruptions in our healthy, um, in the healthy flow of our life, then there are four channels through which these interruptions might manifest. So first of all, maybe we feel um, emotionally constricted, emotionally tight, emotionally upset. Secondly, maybe you experience negative thinking. We have you know, thoughts which are uh, detrimental to our well-being. Thirdly, we may experience some bodily um, issue, instability, some bodily instability. Maybe we feel trembly, maybe we feel weak, maybe our, our body is not working as well as it should. And fourthly, and you know, in some, well, I don't know if most importantly, but fourthly, we experience some disturbance in our breath. Not well, I don't know whether it says it specifically in the Yoga Sutras. Yeah, it does actually. But the ancient yogis always talked about the very intimate links between the way we breathe and the state of our mind. So not only is disturbed breathing a symptom of negative thinking or emotional constriction or, you know, some other uh, interruption or pathology that's going on. One of the, one of the uh, symptoms is disturbed breathing. Not only that, but also controlling the breath or doing something with the breath will have a positive effect on the you know on on a, on a kind of a negative route so one of the ways of dealing with an unstable mind or uh, or a jittery mind is to focus on slowing down the exhalation making the exhalation a stable base and then developing on from there it's just great advice. And uh, Dave Charlton, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I, I, I would. Um, what I would say is specifically that what we feel is that um, the use of the breath should be central to all we do in yoga. Um, so in the way that we practice both the postures, which let's be honest, is the, the, the bit that most people do most of, um, particularly in the modern context at least, that, that, that's for sure, is that um, that's why we really emphasise the importance of good breathing within all of the yoga postures. In, in many respects, I often think of the yoga postures as, well, I think of the, the practice of yoga postures as breath exercises with movement rather than physical exercises which you use the breath a bit. If that makes sense. I would like to put the breath at the heart of the uh, heart of what we do, um, and I think if you do that, it it can transform your 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 sort of practice of, of the the physical postures. Um, even if you don't go up, even if you don't get around to or go on to uh, do more specific breathing exercises. So let's put the breath at the heart of what we do. That's what I would say. Okay, so Dave Charlton and Ranger Roy, I'm going to ask each of you the same question as we conclude. Dave Charlton, why do you think the Yoga Sutras are relevant today? Um, because basically we haven't changed. Uh, the nature of, of human beings <laughs> it truly hasn't changed very much. We, you know, our minds are... Um, are essentially the same. The text is an incredibly insightful text on dealing with the, the nature of our minds and, and how that works and how we can work with it in a positive way. And um, that hasn't changed in 2000 years. So it's good advice and it stood the test of time. 
Ranju, Roy, why do you think the Yoga Sutras are still relevant today? Because the Yoga Sutra presents a really clear model, which is very similar to the Buddhist model, which is that first of all, the reason why we start, the reason why we start practice, the reason, the reason why, yeah, why most people start suffering, uh, practice is dukkha, suffering. It says that's the first step, acknowledging where, where and why we suffer. Then it says that there is actually um, a reason for this dukkha. There's a reason why we suffer and it addresses those reasons. Then it says there is an end of suffering. There's a possibility of finishing that suffering. And finally, he elaborates a path out of the suffering. So it's a kind of a four step model, acknowledging your suffering, looking at how we're perpetuating that suffering and continuing to contribute to that suffering, considering what the end of that suffering is, and then thinking about, well, how are we going to get there? What's the path? And potentially lays it out beautifully. Beautiful wisdom. You've been listening to The Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer and Amazon number one bestselling author. You can find out more about me and my work at katherinekerrigan.com and unlimitedenergynow.com. I also want to point out that while you're signing up for the newsletter, you learn out even more about how you can heal yourself naturally. If you go to unlimitedenergynow.com, you're going to find a whole bunch of free yoga videos showing you how to do the postures. And also there's videos on how to do breathing exercises that I call eight minutes to inner peace. You've been listening to the authors, Dave Charlton and Ranju Roy. They are the co-authors of the wonderful new book, Embodying the Yoga Sutras, Support, Direction, and Space. This book will help you to understand why the Yoga Sutras are still relevant to you today. Uh, Dave Charlton and Renju Roy teach yoga in the West of England and Somerset and Worcester. And you can find out more about Dave Charlton, Renju Roy, and their wonderful work at sadhnamalayogatraining.com. Thank you so much for listening. And remember that a yoga practice and a breathwork practice are profoundly healing on all levels. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.